the assignment I gave you last week. We're going to consider today the works of that great English poet, John Keats. Johnny Jones, will you begin the recitation, please? Uh, sure, teacher. <laughs> uh, just wait till I find the... Um... Oh, here it is. Oh, to a greasy urn by John... Oh, Johnny, not greasy. Grecian, Grecian. Oh, yeah, excuse me. Um, uh... Ode to a Grecian Urn by John Keats. <clears throat> uh, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. Its loveliness increases. No, it no, no. Oh, you're not reading the poem. You're just reading the words, Johnny. Now think about it. Try it again. Okay, teacher. <clears throat> a thing of beauty is a joy forever. It's no, no. Oh, you aren't getting the meaning at all. Now, Johnny, what are the first four words? A uh, thing of beauty. Right. Now, what does it mean? I don't know. Something beautiful again. That's right. Now, what are the next four words? Is a joy forever? Correct. And what does that mean? Oh, something like nice for a long time, maybe? That's the idea. Now, when we put the first four words and the second four words together, what does it mean? Uh, something beautiful is nice for a long time? Yes. Uh, yeah, but I, I don't see you why don't You don't see what, Johnny? Well, uh, I don't see why he didn't say so in the first place. Our friend seems to be having a little difficulty in absorbing culture, but at least he started us off on another excursions in science program. You see, Frank Singeiser, your science reporter, recently interviewed Dr. Alfred V. Kidder of the Carnegie Institution of Washington. Their talk was about archaeology in general and about Mayan culture in particular. What did you find out, Frank? Some rather surprising things, Tuff. For instance, many of our new discoveries about the ruined cities of the ancient Maya were made possible by the great American habit of gum chewing. <laughs> You're kidding. Not at all. You see, those ancient cities are located in southern Mexico and northern Central America. And until relatively recent times, only those on the outskirts of the dense jungle country there had been discovered. Yes, but uh, where does the gum come in? Right here. Chico, the basic ingredient of all chewing gum, comes from the sap of a tree which grows only in what was once the homeland of the Maya. The Chico bleeders have gradually advanced further and further into the jungle and the archaeologists have followed. Now Chico is being taken out by plane, and the building of landing strips to accommodate these planes has made hitherto inaccessible parts of the country easily available. Thus many new cities have been found, new excavations have been made, and a flood of new light has been thrown on the ancient Mayan civilization. What kind of people were they, Frank? And where did they come from? Dr. Kidder told me that they were Indians and that their ancestors came many thousands of years ago from Asia, drifting slowly in across Bering Strait and down through Alaska. They were hunters and fishermen, ignorant of agriculture, pottery-making, weaving, or metalworking. They had no domestic animals except for the dog. And they certainly don't sound very promising. No, they don't. However, after a good many more thousands of years, during which time they had spread slowly over the whole of both North and South America, some tribe, of course we don't know which one, took a great step forward. What was that? They learned to cultivate wild plants. And with the spread of this fundamentally important knowledge, the road to civilization was thrown open to them. For at last, they possessed a dependable food crop. Now what kind of food did they have, Frank? Corn was their great staple. And eventually, they also raised potatoes, beans, squash, and tobacco. Thanks to these, population increased and became concentrated in those regions best suited to agriculture. This, in turn, brought about the development of orderly government and economic systems. The assured food supply made possible the leisure necessary for the development of arts and crafts. Formal religions came into being, stimulating aesthetic and intellectual growth. All this must have taken quite a long time. Indeed, it did. But well before the beginning of the Christian era, there had been planted the seeds of a whole series of higher cultures in Middle America. And of these cultures, the Mayan was preeminent. What made it so special, Frank? 
Well tup judged by any standard, the achievement of the Maya is astonishing. Dr. Kidder told me that without the benefit of metal tools, with no knowledge of the wheel, no beasts of burden, nor any domesticated food or milk producing animals, they successfully brought under cultivation a densely jungled tropical country. And they rendered that country so productive that in their spare time, so to speak, they could construct vast numbers of public buildings and richly adorned temples. It certainly sounds impressive, but weren't they, after all, a pretty crude and savage lot? Apparently not. There was evidently enough leisure and freedom from strife to allow the development of centers of learning, which must have produced individuals of outstanding artistic and mental ability. They were excellent painters and sculptors, accomplished astronomers and able mathematicians. Their keen observation and recording of the movements of the sun, moon, and planets enabled them to predict eclipses. They worked out a marvelous calendar, so perfect that they could place any day, past, present, or future, with absolute accuracy. That must have involved very complex computations. It did, Tup, and the Maya could handle them because they had grasped the concept of zero and used it as we do, which is more than the Romans accomplished. What was Mayan writing like, Frank? It was a system of hieroglyphics, which we unfortunately have not yet discovered how to read, except for some of the calendrical references. If we have interpreted these references correctly, it seems certain that the great period of Mayan culture lasted from about 300 to 600 A.D., in other words, during the dark ages of our own civilization. Did Dr. Kidder say what kind of houses they lived in? He said it was difficult to tell because they all apparently lived in dwellings of wood and thatch, and of course these structures have not survived the passage of time. All we have left are their stone, civic, and ceremonial centers. And uh, what were they like? They were paved squares or plazas surrounded by vaulted temples set on pyramidal bases and richly adorned with painting and sculpture. Some of the temples were of enormous size, reaching a height of over 200 feet. I suppose these plazas were sort of community centers. That's the idea, Tup. On market days and during religious festivals, the people would gather there to buy and sell their wares and to watch the brilliant pageants that took place before the temples. That these functions were spectacular and magnificently staged is evident from a well-preserved series of wall paintings which were recently discovered. And from what you've told me, Frank, the Maya really did have a great civilization. But what happened to it? Dr. Kidder said that we don't really know. About a thousand years ago, something happened, and all the great cities were abandoned. The forests recaptured the hard-won fields. The temples fell into ruin and were swallowed up by the relentless jungle. And that was the end of it? Uh, not quite, Tuck. Mayan culture survived in the Guatemala highlands and in what is now Yucatan, where it persisted in full flower until the 15th century. After that, wars, pestilence, famine, and eventually the coming of the Spaniards put an end to their independent career. And at that point, all the attainments of the ancient Maya, their art, their calendar, their hieroglyphic writing, were lost. Well, are there any Mayas left today, Frank? Yes, indeed. The major part of the population of Yucatan and Guatemala is made up of Maya Indians. And according to Dr. Kidder, the future of these countries depends in large measure on the ability of the Maya to participate effectively in modern democratic life. Thanks a lot, Frank, for reporting to us your conversation on Mayan culture with Dr. Alfred V. Kidder of the Carnegie Institution of Washington. Right now, I'd like to remind you listeners that you can obtain a copy of the paper dealing with today's subject. Just write to Excursions in Science in care of the station to which you are listening and ask for a science paper Number 398. That's science paper 398. We will be glad to send it to you without charge. And now it's question and answer time. On each program, we undertake to answer some of the questions you listeners have asked us concerning scientific matters. And incidentally, if you have sent us a question and haven't heard it answered on the air, don't worry. We don't have time to broadcast all of them, but each question will receive a personal written reply. So keep the questions coming. Now, here's the first one, Frank. Ready? Let's go. Okay. What causes the beautiful colors which one can see in a soap bubble? Uh, they're caused by the phenomenon of interference. 
Sounds more like a football game than a soap bubble. Well, uh, what happens? Well, Tup, the light rays falling on the bubble film are reflected by both the outer and inner surface. For certain thicknesses, the wave that enters the film and is reflected from the back will come out in step with the waves from the surface, and they are reflected. But how about other thicknesses? For thicknesses in between those that give reflection, the wave from the inner surface will be out of step with the wave from the outside, and so they will cancel each other out. Thus, as the thickness of the bubble film changes, some colors are canceled and others reflected. So you get the well-known play of color that we've all seen. And here's our next question, Frank. It's from a listener who wants to know how he can prevent the discoloration of the chromium-plated exhaust pipe extension on his car. Mm, I'm afraid our correspondent is out of luck on that one, Tup. There's no practical solution to his problem since chromium, as well as nickel and copper plating, is adversely affected by the hot exhaust gases. They simply will not stand up indefinitely under that kind of heat. There's nothing he can do then? Not much, I'm afraid. However, some of the better exhaust pipe extensions have an extra plate or baffle underneath the chromium shell, and that helps to deflect the exhaust gases away, thus prolonging the life of the chromium plate somewhat. Another motorist has written us, Frank, with a different problem. What's his trouble? Seems he parked his car under some trees, Sap from the buds fell on the car, and now he can't get the sticky stuff off. Our friend may have to try two or three different materials to deal with this problem. I'd suggest that he begin with a warm water solution of some mild household detergent. If this doesn't work, he might try applying some kerosene with a soft cloth. This should remove the sap. Will the kerosene injure the finish of the car? No, except to remove the wax if the car has been waxed. Good enough. Now I'll try your hand at this one from a listener with a rather unusual hobby. She makes dolls and uses flour for the stuffing. Well, what's the matter with that? Nothing except that some kind of insect gets into the flour and thus destroys the dolls. Oh, oh. Well, the insects are probably either rice weevils or flower beetles. I feel sure that the damage could be prevented by mixing one ounce of wettable 50% BDT powder to each 25 or 30 ounces of flour. This treatment should give lasting protection. What's our next question, Top? Uh, here's a listener who wants to know how valuable an IQ test is. An intelligence test from which a person's IQ or intelligence quotient is determined is of great value when properly interpreted. However, such tests are not perfect, and they do not show the subject's real native ability independently of his background of experience. And even if they were absolutely reliable, they might not show such information as whether or not a person would be a good provider, for instance. Why not? Because such information may involve factors other than intelligence. Thus, a person of high intelligence, prevented by circumstances from getting into a position where his intelligence could be utilized, might be very unhappy, find it hard to keep inferior jobs, and thus be a poor provider. On the other hand, a person of middle or even somewhat low intelligence might realize his shortcomings, be happy, satisfied, and steady in his work and thus be a good provider. Well, Frank, my IQ may be no record breaker, but I do know one thing. What's that? Our time is up, and we'll have to go. So thanks a lot for today's interview. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're puzzled by some scientific question or other, all you have to do is jot it down on a postcard or letter and send it along to us. We'll refer it to the General Electric Research Laboratory or some other equally reputable organization, find out the correct answer, and send you a personal written reply. Just send your questions to Excursions in Science in care of the station to which you are listening. Be sure to include your own name and address when you write. And, by the way, if you'd like a copy of the paper dealing with today's subject, Mayan Culture, just write to Excursions in Science in care of the station and ask for science paper number 398. That's science paper 398. And now this is Howard Tupper and Frank Singheiser saying goodbye until the next Excursions in Science program.